now whenever we are talking about uh, swapping there are two different standards or uh, not standards but two different types of architectures that one may follow one is the standalone model where the charging swapping and the distribution happens at one single place so you imagine there is a swap station you go there he has that track he has kept the dispensing unit there and he also charges this at the same place another model which is a hub and spoke model where uh, assume that we have kind of a go down where the operator is charging all those batteries and in the morning uh, somebody comes as a logistics driver or he has a van he takes those batteries and circulates it to all maybe kirana shops or departmental stores or everywhere any any who can corner of the city where uh, uh, there would be number of people who who would be coming to those stations to pick up those batteries so those are the stations where only swaps batteries are kept so interchanging station but there is no charging that is happening there because he may not have a space he may not have the electricity connection he may not have the ethernet connection and etc etc largely a model that we follow for cylindrical cylinders de delivery system so cylinders are also delivered like that yeah so not that all distribution centers for cylinders would have the cylinder filling station as well so that is a model that we follow for hub and spoke model now if we talk about distributed architecture it looks quite simple we say that uh, <coughs> uh, it's a stand alone model where everything is happening but architecturally wide why is what is happening is uh, there is a user who actually comes to a swap station swap charging station and exchanges that battery gives the discharge battery asks for a charge battery back and goes away but while he does that a lot of transaction is happening between that this guy should understand it is my battery or somebody somebody's else battery right he should also understand that how did he use his battery i gave him the battery at such and such health of the battery but when he gave it back what was the health and the status not only health how much is the energy that he has utilized okay so all that information he has to capture in that quick transaction that he does that he's giving you the battery and uh, taking the discharge battery so in that quick calcul quick interaction there has to be a system that tells that everything is fine and what is the usage what is the bill and how he has to charge unlike uh, so this that's a difference between when we talk about cylinder system wherein cylinder is whatever level though they give 14.5 kg is every cylinder that's a standard that they have formulated so it is not that you would be utilizing less or you will be given more energy and all that so the fuel in that package remains same but for us while we issue the battery it could be different capacity for two different users while we take the battery also you may use uh, different capacity he may use different capacity so the utilization could also be different so when the utilizations are different we need to capture that what is the utilization that has happened and accordingly i need to bill him right so that is what actually uh, happens and the two interfaces that we define is battery energy reading interface and battery issuing interface which is nothing but an interface between charger and the battery either that is what we would define or an interface if i'm using an app to read the battery so this is an app to battery interface or charger to battery interface okay so this basically depends upon i'm talking about an automated system or a uh, system wherein i'm using only a simple charger to charge the battery so if there is an intelligence in the charger it will read all that data and say that yeah i took the battery at this uh, rate and i'm dispensing it at this uh, energy level and this is what i have to uh, charge the payment and the payment comes on the top on the uh, on the display board and you charge the bill he pays it there and then and goes or else he uses his app in the app you scan it and you get the notification that hey this is the bill i have to pay you pay the bill and you go okay so both the interfaces could be there and all the interfaces would get recorded in your web portal or your server second system which we call it as centralized architecture wherein the batteries are charged at one station and then get distributed to different levels now here uh, uh, what comes into picture is the logistics leg 
So apart from that actually everything else is same. In the logistics leg what is happening is that he is going, this fellow is going to the bulb charging station, collects those battery batteries and then start to drop in one swap station, second swap station, third swap station and everywhere else he is distributing. And what we need to do is that whatever distribution is happening, uh, we keep on controlling uh, that distribution. I mean you have all the records that at any given point in time, what are the batteries that are there. So your battery as an operator you need to track every moment. So every minute I should know that out of my 1 lakh batteries, these many thousands of batteries are there in the swap station, these many batteries are there in the vehicles, these are there in the charging station, these are there in the maintenance center and these are there where some fault has happened and I need to take them out of the system. So at every given point in time since I as an operator own the asset and that's my business to track the asset because that's the business I need to I need to make. If I lose one asset also I am losing the business of the day or a month. Right? So that's where you need to track all that information and that's how all those tra uh, transactions need to be captured in the, in the CMS. So four set of interfaces that we need to understand here. One, the user to the base swap station. Second, base swap station to logistics. And third, logistics and vice versa. Fourth, logistics uh, to BCS. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Fourth, which is not specified here, is actually all these interfaces to the cloud. Okay. Now, all the interfaces that happen to the cloud, they could be either 2G, 3G. We cannot have Ethernet. Ethernet can happen only here, right? The uh, uh, the only interface that can happen on Ethernet is here, but rest of them have to be the wireless interfaces. So coming to the swap standards, uh, like we talked about the public standards, there are swap standards also, though there are no real standards that are existing globally. Uh, none that has been standardized, but they are in 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 draft stage, I would say. So in the draft stage, there are two standards. One is IEC 61851 and second is 62840. Uh, both these standards actually specify how to swap the battery uh, with the swap station. So they all talk about the battery as, as one actor, swap station as another actor. Logistics come in one of these uh, standards, which is actually in 62840 and not being talked about 61851. And they also talk about how do we lay out the swap uh, stations. Spe specifically, this is talked about in 62840. When we talk about 61851, it just gives the basic definition that irrespective of the chemistry of the battery, the state of charge of the battery, state of health of the battery, how to have, how to make the swap happen and uh, how to make it risk free and safe. So all those protection mechanisms are specified and they also specify three levels of BSS that is fully automated, semi-automated and manual. Whereas when we talk about 62840, it talks about all different other aspects also. So what should be the lane system? What should be the layout of the swap station? So if the bus is coming, it should be coming from this direction and go out from this direction and that should happen. And uh, something like if it is a side swap or bottom swap or top swap, uh, how these things should be handled. So they lay out uh, very detailed mechanical systems, very detailed handling system. They also specify how the user should be actually interacting with the battery. So it's a very, very detailed system. The difference between the two is 61851-3 is specified for LEV applications, whereas 62840 is actually for HEV application. So that is the most important difference between these standards, wherein uh, the voltages, they cater to up to 120 volt DC, whereas since these are uh, HEV standards, 62840 handles 1500 volt up to 1500 volt DC systems. And um, if we talk about uh, 61851, there are general communication requirements, there are general protection requirements, so on and so forth, which are also there for there in 62840 apart from other layouts, etc. 
uh, not going much into details of uh, all this, but yes, what are what is happening between the standard, the latest update is uh, probably six one eight five one hash three is getting scrapped and getting merged into six two eight four zero, or vice versa would happen. Why? Because I see as a committee felt that there should be only one standard catering to the swapping and should not be categorized with LEV, MEV, or HEV. And everything should be taken up as a very holistic approach and specified as that if it is safety, for safety, for LEV it should be this, for MEV it should be this and HEV should be this. So that anyone and everyone, everyone who is looking at swap as a business or as an operation or as a technology, then these are the things that should be uh, taken care of and how to migrate from one system to another. So whole of it is getting now uh, merged, though their standard is still to be out. And at BIS also, there is a standard committee that has just been formed with the mandate that we should have our own Indian swap standard, because around the globe, uh, there are not much people or not much use cases for standards that emerge uh, for swapping. Uh, why is that? Because standards, wherever it has been formed, is is Fortunately, unfortunately, you decide, but yeah, it has been through these, uh, through the developed countries and develop, developing countries actually have been adopting those standards only, which have been framed by developed countries. In the developed countries, mostly whichever country we pick up, uh, where EVs would have happened and mostly like Scandinavian countries and other countries, uh, they do not have two wheelers and three wheelers. In our country, we have majority of two wheelers and three wheelers and even our delivery, logistics and all those use cases for commercial applications as well are taking, uh, uh, ha, is being done now more and more with two wheelers and three wheelers. Now, if we talk about EVs as an adoption for all these services, we also know that EVs is not going to happen without swap. Why? If it is commercial application, people are not going to wait for charging their vehicle in the mid of their business, right? And if it is a fleet operator, let's say, they are operating through uh, three wheelers or cars. Uh, if a car is taking five hours, they're losing the five hours money. So obviously there won't be any shift from ICE to EVs. For ICE to EVs in commercial application, to make a sense for the EVs in that kind of a business, swapping has to be there. And uh, you would say then, then why swapping? Why not have long range vehicles? The long range vehicles, the problem is you would need longer batteries also. Longer batteries means high capacity batteries. So if we are talking about high, high capacity batteries, that will result in problem of cost. So they will come out to be very costly and no one would be able to afford that. In whatever category we are talking about, uh, we can't afford in general a bike of 3 lakhs, 4 lakhs, 5 lakhs for a delivery application because that guy cannot afford it. Right? So if, if we are to talk about commercial business and the affordability end result of whatever technology we are, we are talking about, they have to make sense of it. And that's where swapping has to be there. And since we are not seeing that any developed countries or such standards would be there in place very soon, that is where India thought that, yes, we need to do it. And since there is no standard existing, frame our own standards. Uh, one of the standards, LSVBCC, uh, that got formulated, I won't say it's a standard, uh, by BIS, this is a standard by Open Consortium, which our center started to lead, uh, to lead about three years back, and we formulated that standard. It's called as Lock Smart Vehicle Battery Charger Cloud Protocol, uh, which we formulated with about a set of 35 companies, so there was a consortium which met and kind of started to define that what should be the interface, what should be the message between EV and swap station or you say HHT which is a handle device, nothing but your mobile phone. What should be an interface and definition that you need to have between logistics, between CMS and uh, the bulk charging station. Keeping on view, one interoperability has to happen that you can have uh, batteries from uh, <coughs> supplier A, B, C, D. So what do they need to have as a communication protocol that gets uh, mapped 
or working with the bulk charging station from again the OEM or the charging manufacturer A, B, C, D, whosoever. So there has to be a linkage between that. So that is specified. Second, the safety and protections that have to be inbuilt and taken care of that what all different uh, 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 um, capacities should be there, what should be uh, uh, the dimension of the battery, what should be the minimum performance. So what is also specified not in the protocol but in the overall standard is the minimum performance guarantees that you need to have. So since we know that chemistries are evolving, right? so we say that one of the limitation of a standard is that if we specify everything today, how would we go to a next? jump to the technology. Would we write another standard? No. So what we thought was um, specify a minimum performance guarantee that in this size of the battery, you're going to give me minimum of let's say 2 kilowatt hour energy. You can provide better, it's better. But minimum of this is what you have to guarantee you're going to provide. What else is required for from a battery point of view is how many number of times I can swap that battery. I can swap that battery 500 times or 1000 times or 2000 times or 100 times only. So this minimum warranty or performance is what the OEM has to guarantee me, right? So there are minimum performance parameters that are specified and good interfaces that, that would be there. So what kind of connector you should have and if your, connect, uh, your physical connector is defined, what is the communication over which you should be communicating? Overall, if we talk about protocol in a nutshell, we have a battery as our first actor, EV as second, and there is a driving protocol that is specified between the EV and the battery, because that's where the authentication has to happen between the battery and the electric vehicle. Okay? And authentication would only happen if we have actually standardized the protocol. But given in a lot of confidentiality and encryption that happens between these two devices to say that yes they are able to authenticate each other and there is always a newer key that is generated as far as that particular vehicle is concerned because we want why is that because we're talking about lock smart battery it needs to get locked with that particular vehicle so this particular vehicle one particular key has to be there which is very unique in nature and cannot be duplicated. So that is one standard, we call it as driving protocol and vehicle, which also specifies not only the authentication key, but also tells that what are the data I should capture during drive and in what format I should store that data. Second, the interface that we have between the two actors as battery and the user, which is the handheld device. So how should I communicate that? How should I tell? Uh, as a battery to this mobile user that this is my current state of charge, this is my current state of health and this is how I have been utilized, right? So that and then with the charger. So if we see for a battery, the battery has three interfaces, one with the user, another with the charger, third with the vehicle and whole of this is actually specified in the protocol. And finally, how would the charger get all the data from the battery and push it onto the cloud. So whole of it is actually specified with the great details on the message, message structures and all that information and finally to the user what all information as a as a combined information you should you should actually relate to that and remember that uh, all these com complexities the users or we as public or users of the technology, we don't want to know that, right? What are the complexities? What is happening behind that? So how do we represent it in a very, very simplistic terms is also basically some, some definition that is given here. That's all actually we, I wanted to cover today both on public chargers and swap stations. Any doubts here? Any questions on swapping? Could be around uh, protocols, could be around standardization, could be around chargers, technical or business side, anything that you have in mind, you're curious to know, please please do ask. So when we are talking about uh, lock smart battery, <coughs> the casing is finally a mechanical <laughs> casing, can always be broken. What the cost most is the cell? Yeah. Cell can be recovered and can be used. One can have a low cost EMS or can develop it. 
what will we do with? With that scenario. With cells? Yeah. Not only cells. If any cells happen, it's generally not used as it is. So they will either will cut in pieces or parts recover and then sell it. <coughs> so same thing can happen still with the uh, True. So what we are trying to address is that uh, not everyone thinks about stealing the battery, right? If anyone, everyone knows that we are being tracked. So there is, um, um, it's, it's kind of, I can't uh, really give a good analogy when we say that, yeah, you have CCTV cameras. Now CCTV cameras do not protect that crime would not happen, right? But you know that what is, what is happening around that. Uh, not a great analogy, but I would say that what is what we are trying to do is one that you have logged the battery with the vehicle, logged the battery with the charger. So the user has no choice but to come to you to exchange the battery, general user. But if it is that intentionally there is a person who is saying that we go vandalism, I, I need to do that vandalism and he comes to do, comes on that. Then apart from that, if you have the trackers inside the battery, you can track the location. But once it is gone, it is gone, right? So what they do with the cells, how would they take it out, how much of uh, uh, the value they get out of it and how many batteries would be issued to one user in a go. Is, is, is a limited this thing. So what we have done is that we have tried to increase with this method the circulation that happens. Yeah. So as a user, if I'm not able to track or log the battery, think about our cases also. If it is that I'm allowed to keep the battery forever or I'm allowed to charge the battery, I will just take the battery, keep on charging the battery and never return him. Or uh, this could be intentional or unintentional also, because if I know that I am not going to pay penalty for it, right? That I got it issued day one, I have to return it on day two or day three or day four. But if I keep on using it and, and my there is a tracker who knows that the battery is also gone, right? Uh, it's 100% discharged, but you are just keeping it. So there are two ways of charging the user. One, you charge him for the payment uh, for the energy that he has consumed. Second, you put him uh, the charge for the time that he is utilizing it. So if it is within 24 hours, maybe you don't charge him anything. But if you, he's just forcefully keeping the battery a set with himself, you can say that, yeah, I'll charge him based upon the time also. So those are few things that if you have intelligence in the battery and a mechanism that you can track your asset, you can add a lot many layers of business to ensure that your what to do with your asset but yeah if you get the user who is actually hell bound to vandalize it you can't do anything any any intelligence built on that can can go for a toss and as far as the packaging is concerned so as per the standards or the protocols it doesn't specify it has to be metallic or any other material um, you can give me a battery with a gold platinum whatever uh, metal we just specify that how many number of cycles it should be able to provide and it should be able to last that many cycles and that is a warranty that we ask for so we wind up okay thank you so much thanks everyone <laughs>